ऑस्ट्रेलिया It's a very sunny Friday morning over here in Islamabad, so please make sure that you do kind of acquaint yourself with this transitioning weather because we really do not want anybody to fall ill. And please make sure that you follow all the standard operating procedures put in place so that you can avoid COVID. Hello, Mahin. Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Assalamualaikum, Shahzad. Good morning to you and good morning to all of the wonderful viewers out there watching PTV World and World this morning. So it's a brand new day again, and we bring you lots of uh, infotainment, and and we hope that you. implement that too in your life exactly infotainment ladies and gentlemen information and entertainment is equally important if we want to do kind of entertain our audiences out there in 46 different countries but we definitely hope and pray that you're ready to kick start your day with us but to get started ladies and gentlemen first things first mahin obviously it's really very important that we remember our heroes which is why today in the first place just at the very beginning ladies and gentlemen we are going to remember mm alam saab as well because it happens to be his ninth death anniversary ladies and gentlemen and to be very honest i think the entire nation needs to know about the heroic act he put up ladies and gentlemen while the ninth death anniversary of national hero mm M. alam is being observed today who actually downed five enemy planes within a minute during the 1965 war in september 1965 mahin mm M. alam saab had encountered indian war jets at three different points the enemy clearly had more military capacity than pakistan however the air encounters paved way for certain events which remain unparalleled in the history of air force so heroic now in less than a minute shahzad five military jets of the indian air force were downed one after another by alam saab as he hit targets flying his saber 86 jet and that's just great so our uh, prayers go out to him obviously may his soul rest in peace ladies I mean. and gentlemen and allah pak inko apne jawad e rehmat mein jagah de for the kind of actions he's or for the kind of service uh, ladies and gentlemen he's provided to his nation as well and prayers and patience for all of those people who were bereaved as well just because he's not around as well but moving on <coughs> it's a great day and as we say that you know we always want to kind of share on a uh, start on a very positive note mahin so imagine today ladies and gentlemen yom tashakkur is being observed and why is it being observed is something which we really need to share with you all So the nation observes Yom Tov Shukr today after the United Nations finally recognized the grave Islamophobia challenge confronting the world. Now United Nations had adopted a landmark resolution introduced by Pakistan on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation uh, designating 15 March as International Day to Combat Islamophobia. And you know what the Prime Minister Imran Khan had raised his voice against the rising trend of Islamophobia at international forums including at the United Nations. and called on the global community to combat the challenge pakistan television will air special transmission on islamophobia and will highlight the unflinching efforts of prime minister to tackle islamophobia shahzad it will also broadcast a documentary with a chronology of hate events against muslims and foreign missions as important countries including the united states european <laughs> union and gulf cooperation council will organize events to shed light on pakistan's role in tackling islamophobia exactly and ladies and gentlemen you know the world over obviously the efforts of prime minister imran khan has been recognized as well and and to talk about it ladies and gentlemen it's not just the western region of this entire planet where islamophobia exists i think and i believe that it exists some somewhat everywhere and it's because of the radicalization which has taken place as well and people have their own narratives and agendas and they use religion for that matter as well and there's there's going to be one more advantage So, you know while people will voice their concerns about how to curb islamophobia and it's really very important for us as muslims and the entire muslim umma came together in the oic meeting as well where you know this resolution was actually proposed by pakistan as well but to be very honest i think mahin what we really need to kind of pinpoint over here is that you know just because that people will be so well aware Uh, about this very campaign as well i think that people from all other religions will benefit from it exactly, as well because exactly shahzad it's not just islamophobia i think people one way or the other when it comes down to their own agendas they would never leave behind anybody else or any other religion as well which is why for a better understanding we actually have a small package for you all please go ahead take a look 
take a listen and once you guys will come back, we will be in conversation with somebody who can help us understand how to curb Islamophobia. What you think is not important in this country. You need to understand you... that what you think is zero. Islamophobia is a prejudice, aversion, hostility or hatred towards Muslims and encompasses any distinction, exclusion, restriction, discrimination or preference against Muslims that has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment or exercise on an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural or any other field of public life. Today, Islamophobia in the entire world manifests itself through individual attitudes and behaviours and the policies and practices of organisations and institutions. Examples are physical or verbal attacks on property, places of worship in people, verbal or online threats of violence, vilification and abuse. <laughs> Since coming to power in 2018, the Pakistani Prime Minister has often raised the issue of rising attacks against Muslims. Islamophobia since 9-11 has, has grown at a pace where it is alarming. And where, how did this Islamophobia start? Because certain Western leaders equated terrorism with Islam. The initiative of Russian President Vladimir Putin is a fruit of Prime Minister Imran Khan's efforts on Islamophobia. If there is an insult against Prophet Muhammad, do you think this is about exercising your freedom of creativity? I don't think so. I think it's an infringement of the freedom of religion. This is also an insult to the sacred feelings of people who profess Islam. The Canadian government has decided to appoint a special representative to combat Islamophobia. How can we look families in the eye and say Islamophobia isn't real? When you listen, to the black Muslim woman who constantly looks over her shoulder at the bus stop, fearing someone will pull off her hijab or hurt her. Prime Minister Imran Khan welcomed Trudeau's plan to appoint a special representative to combat Islamophobia. The ultimate goal in countering Islamophobia should be to create a fair and just society for all, one that values and safeguards the citizenship of its members. Islamophobia, hence the entire nation today comes together to observe Yomit Shakur and we'll, we will continue to do so. And I believe it's really very important for each and every individual to know why 15th of March is actually being picked up as a day where Islamophobia will be curbed on this day as well. And it's because of the fact that the very event where New Zealand two um, armed people went into a mosque as well, I think that's the very uh, reason why uh, Islamophobia Day is actually, or Yomit Shakur will be observed, ladies and gentlemen. But at this point of time, what we really need to kind of think about Maheen is that since I have mentioned that, you know, all the other religions are going to benefit from it. But what I do not get is that there's a discrimination uh, going on, there's a divide going on. And what happens is that, God forbid, if somebody within the West is going to do so, they are always going to say, hey, you know what, he had a mental problem, he was going through depression yes, and exactly. whatnot. Yes, exactly. They, they, they downplay the whole thing. Exactly. exactly. And all of a sudden, when it comes down to our region where the, it's the Muslim majority, you know, they kind of blame it on They would religion. actually build a narrative um, that is based on exaggeration. Like, uh, for example, there are different levels of Islamophobia, Shahzad. Uh, this is on individual level, this is on a structural level, this is on a dialectic level where they create narratives on media, they, they create campaigns. And we have to combat the uh, this through different strategies, uh, not just, you know, on every level we have to combat. This is not an individual fight. This is not a structural. It is everywhere now. So we have to be really ready to fight this. Exactly. And how to fight this is something which we will be talking about in this very segment as well. But at this point of time, one more thing which I would love to add over here is, and ladies and gentlemen, that is that, you know, what has happened so far is that we as Muslims, we, I think, have gone a little far away from uh, the life of Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Salaamu the Holy Book Quran. And, uh, you know, obviously, duly, we need to blame ourselves that we weren't really able to project the right image of our religion as well. And to be very honest, our religion gives us the message of peace. Our religion gives us the message of equality. For whatever I can do, Mahin can do that too as well. So for everybody who actually 
one day wakes up and starts to blame Islam, all you need to do is you need to read about or study about the life of Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam because th that's the epitome of the entire Muslim Ummah as well and that's where we look, that's the beacon of hope. And like, that's that's where we learn from every single day. And our Quran, Holy Book Quran, ladies and gentlemen, tells us about whatever comes across in life. Quran is always going to let us know about how we really need to deal with it as well. But to kind of talk about this and to kind of talk about how radicalization has kind of projected Islamophobia all over the world, we are very lucky that we've actually been joined by Dr. Zafar Iqbal Saab as well. So, Professor Saab, Assalamu alaikum, good morning, how are you? Walaikum as salam and thank you very much. I'm great. I hope you all people are very um, enjoying your day and uh, starting your discussion on a very important topic of Islamophobia. I'm great exactly, sir, and thank you very much. You know, we kind of uh, equally want to thank you as well for taking advantage of this opportunity. And, you know, we always wanted you to share your wisdom on how to curb Islamophobia. First of all, obviously, it's great that 15th of March will be ob observed. That's happening for the very first time. Pakistanis proposed his Prime Minister Imran Khan went on to make sure that you know he's going to curb this menace but sir uh, the only question is do you think that it's because of radicalization that we have projected islamophobia or god forbid all of those other people who have done so or who had this very agenda to themselves do you think it's because of radicalization or do you think that there are other factors to it as well uh, a very important thing is that Islamophobia is, uh, of course, radicalization, but it has been through different phases and different face facets at the same time in the history. I mean, radicalization is something that we can just talk about it in the contemporary phase of Islamophobia. But earlier in the past, it has been, of course, available in the shape of prejudice, as well as uh, in a kind of, you see, fear that was there from Muslims and Islam, of course, and uh, it was, of course, considered as a religious racism as well. Sometimes, uh, in some of the societies, uh, Islam and Muslims were taken as a political, social, and cultural threats at the same time. So I think the radicalization, or you can see the right of right wing uh, in the Europe and in America, actually that has given a kind of few impetus to kind of radicalization as a symbol of Islamophobia. But as Mahin just said, I think I would like to shed some light on that, which is very important, that Islamophobia, of course, has become now a social order in most part of the world. I mean, it is not something at individual level, at a group level. Rather, this has become, you see, a kind of climate that is prevailing in most part of the world. So anybody who is in, not as such Islamophobic, but he is unable to, in fact, behave in the way that he wants to about Muslims and Islam. He is under the influence of that climate, of that kind of social pressure, which is, in fact, driving his behavior towards Muslim and Islam. That is, um, I mean, this is something very new that we have lately come across, and we have, in fact, called it as neo-Islamophobia. Islamophobia has, in fact, taken a different shape. I think, sir, your network's cutting away as well. We'll give you a few seconds to kind of restore your network because it's very important, and what you're saying is really very important for our people to learn as well because... Just right now, ladies and gentlemen, obviously we'll try to connect him back, uh, connect w back with him as well. But uh, at this point of time, Mahin, what I wanted to say was that, you know, he said that, you know, there are people a lot uh, who are under a lot of social pressure and hence they gain that influence and then they come and they propose that, hey, you know, all of this is happening because of that. And I wanted to continue with this conversation. We tried to get him back on call, but you wanted to add, right? Yeah, I wanted to add, uh, you must have seen there was a hate gathering in Indian state and they were actually threatening Muslims, uh, you know, openly and they were threatening the community, especially Muslims. So what can be uh, done about that? I wa really wanted to ask about him because the institutions in India are all radicalized. They're all hyper-nationalized and they don't care about justice. Exactly. So Professor Saab has joined us. So Professor Saab, Maheen has a very important, imperative, pivotal question. Uh, so Maheen, why don't you say it again? Uh, Dr. Zafar, I wanted to ask you, there was a hate gathering that happened in India and it was very openly threatening and they were threatening of killing Muslims, especially communities. So what can uh, we do to counter such uh, hate speeches and hate gatherings? Because we cannot expect anything from Indian courts. They have lost their uh, sense of justice. They are highly um, nationalized, hyper-nationalized. Very important point. I think we have to take advantage of now the 15th March declaration uh, by the United Nations and where Imran Khan has, of course, played a very important role. Rather, this is a kind of hallmark achievement on his part. 
So now this is the time that we have to, in fact, accrue the benefits of declaration of this kind of day. Now, if, for example, uh, you see there are more than, you see, 16 percent of Muslims, uh, Muslims are in population of India, and they are persecuted and they are marginalized, and you see a lot many problems they are facing. Now, after the declaration of this uh, Islamophobia as a, as a universal concept, I think now we have every right to, in fact, move to court of justice, international court of justice, declaring it a kind of see, genocide, a kind of you see marginalization, or Islamophobic kind of thing on part of Muslims and Muslim world. Now, for instance, we have just uh, uh, OIC's conference, foreign minister's conference around the corner. We should take this issue over there, and we should now develop a consortium against this kind of thing, and this should be taken to International Court of Justice. And here, only not the people living in main India, mainland India, rather the Kashmiris, I mean the Muslims, those who have been, you see, ghettoized in the entire region of Kashmir, they have to be liberated through uh, taking this uh, from the lens of Islamophobia and filing another case in the International Court of Justice. And uh, uh, right now, India has become the epicenter of Islamophobia in South Asia. So it has to be tackled at a very concerted and very organized fashion. And of course, uh, uh, coming up, uh, OIC conference can play some role in that. Exactly. And, and sir, thank you very much for uh, elaborating upon the, the very important question which Ms. Maheen actually asked. But sir, at this point of time, what I really need to ask is that now, obviously, we come together to observe Yom et and it's great that how we can actually go to the International Court of Justice and kind of get our answers and it's brilliant but sir we have had seen in the past as well and now we see it in just alongside our neighbors as well that the hindutva mindset is ruling and you know where she said that it's hyper nationalism as well we can see that students are not allowed to wear hijabs to their universities let's uh, let's talk about the indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir where you know the, the cleansing is taking place and they're making sure that a lot of people are going to come in from India, that God forbid if one day there's going to be a plebiscite, you know, so all of that, that's a very political sphere. But sir, at this point of time, don't you think that, you know, uh, while we talk about curbing Islamophobia and talking about Hindutva and how Hindutva mindset has actually disturbed the entire Muslim Ummah just because of the very fascist actions of India and Modi, how do you think that in days to come, we'll be able to curb that? In the first place, how do we project the right image of Islam by making sure that we are closer to the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we know as Muslims that what our Holy Book Quran tells us? That's a very important thing. I think uh, at the first point, I mean, the first portion of your question is very important that how we can in fact raise this point for the entire world. I think here is very important thing that we have to take into confidence our Arab world as well, because Arab world can play a very important role. You see a lot of uh, uh, Hindu uh, diaspora is living in uh, Arab world, and uh, if they are creating some kind of problem there, so of course uh, some kind of, you see, admonishing words or admonishing, admonishing sentences should, to, should go to diplo through diplomatic channel to Indian government, that if they will continue doing these kind of things with the Muslim living in India, mm -hmm. of course that would create a lot many problems for the for the Hindus and the Indians, those who are living in the Muslim world. So this, I would, I, I think that would play a very important role. The second part is very important that how we can, at this international level, combat Islamophobia. I think we have to understand this thing, or uh, that Islamophobia is in fact multifaceted and is a kind of complex problem. And it can not only be, of course, countered with the help of some kind of television channel and just projecting your point of view and soft image of Muslims. It is very important to understand that Islamophobia is, in fact, has become an industry in the West now. Because those who are committing Islamophobic kind of thing, they, they are learning, earning a lot of uh, money, as well as a lot of money is being poured into to create some kind of negativities about Muslims, Islam, and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is very important that we have to check that why this money and who is, in fact, investing this money. So as they have, in fact, SATF, Financial Action Task Force regime in Pakistan, where they are looking at it, that how the money is being spilling to some kind of extremist activity, we should have that get that kind of thing in the West as well, where the Islamophobic kind of money is being given to the, to the media, to the organizations. So Islamophobia, SATF, I think, is the need of the time for the Western world, where a lot of money is being poured in. I can just give you an example, the one who has produced a 14-minute trailer, and that was once uploaded on YouTube. 
This was, in fact, an innocence of Muslim. The man himself, in fact, had confessed that he was paid 500 million U.S. dollars for producing this 14-minute trailer against our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I mean, uh, there should be some kind of, you see, uh, legal action against that person. And the Muslim Ummah and Muslim a big organization like OIC, Muslim World Week, uh, Muslim World League, they should, in fact, uh, uh, initiate some kind of, you see, proceedings against these kind of actions. Similarly, FBI, I mean, U.S. Uh, investigation agency, that itself is saying that more than 872 hate groups are operating only in the United States. So who is, in fact, fueling them? Who is, in fact, sending them? So these are all very important things that we need to, in fact, identify and take some kind of action so that the Islamophobic feelings should be reduced at a very drastic level. Very important it is that what kind of, you see, literature is being produced in the West to, to generate or fan these kind of feelings among Dr. the Western. That has important. to be, of course, countered at the same time. Hmm. There's something very important I want to ask. I wanted to ask you, how can we empower the communities across the world? Should there be a tool book, um, uh, uh, you know, a guidebook, something like that, which should have actionable items? Because we need a campaign, or some sort of campaign. we can use to kind of empower them. Lovely. This is, this is, again, very important thing that the Muslims living in the West, they have actually lacked many problems within themselves. That is, of course, of course, you see, flaring the anti-Islam and anti-Muslim sentiments. For example, they most of the time get eyes in the, some of the places and they, they uh, do not go for mainstreaming or integrating or assimilating themselves in the main cultural system where they are in living in. So that creates, you see, a lot of problems. Second very important thing within Muslims, Muslim people living in the West, they are in fact not interested to join the leadership positions in those countries. I mean, they don't like to go into police, into army, or they do not like to be liar, or they hardly participate in politics. They are more interested in minting money kind of businesses where they can earn more and more money because they, have, they count everything in terms of dollars. Mm. So some kind of, you see, campaigns have to be started from, uh, you see, at international level, from the international organizations, those who, uh, who uh, those, those can, in fact, launch these kind of campaigns, that they should come into powerful positions in those systems, they should integrate themselves, and they should not, in fact, uh, go for exclusive kind of their ritual, uh, whether this is cultural or religious, rather they should go to for all inclusive kind of. I mean, you see, Eid and month of Ramadan is just around the corner. So we should celebrate it as, you see, a, uh, all inclusive activity of course then of, uh, this would help people understand that islam is in fact religion of peace and the people those who are followers of islam they are also very reasonable people and not as such radicalized and fundamentalist so some exactly. kind of campaign I in the west has to be started of course that would require a lot of money because it's not yeah. an easy job because every country has a different situation about muslims and everybody who's living over there so it's exactly, that sir, exactly sir, and thank you very much for your, uh, you know, comprehensive answers on, on, on the questions we had uh, uh, according to Islamophobia or, you know, how to kind of curb this menace which has been going on all over the West as well. But uh, Professor Dr. Zafar Iqbal sahab, thank you very much, sir, for your time. We wish and we pray that you're going to have a great day alongside all our viewers out there as well. Thank you very much, sir, thank once again much, for sir. making us understand it so beautifully well and that how can we curb this very menace which exists. Thank you very much once again. God bless. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we actually need to head out towards a short break because once you guys will come back, we actually have another very important day to talk about. Obviously, Islamophobia, ladies and gentlemen, is something which we all need to come together to curb. And it's because of the fact that, you know, that's the very thing which I've said right at the beginning as well, that we have been very far away from the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is actually the beacon of hope for all of us, where, which is actually the epitome of learning as well. And we certainly have, might have somewhere forgotten our way as well and we really need to kind of jump back onto the bandwagon and for everybody who's out there ladies and gentlemen uh, when we talk about any religion may it be islam may it be christianity may it be judaism what we really need to kind of talk about is that you know that all of these religions come down to very one facet that it's all about peace and love and for anybody to kind of think other way around all you need to do is please make sure that you do your own research and how much importance do we have for research is something which we will be talking about in the next segment. Don't go anywhere. We will be right, right back. back.
Sarangi is a bowed, short-necked string instrument from subcontinent, which is used in Pakistani classical music. Its flexible tunability and its ability to produce a large pillow of tonal color and emotional nuance makes it unique. Carved from a single block of wood, the sarangi has a box-like shape with three hollow chambers called stomach, chest and brain. people thank you very much for staying tuned to ptv world you're definitely watching what this morning alongside shahzad asan khan and miss maheen jafri earlier ladies and gentlemen we were talking about how the entire nation comes together to observe yom e tashakkur but before heading out towards a short break we did talk about how research is very important and to kind of talk about that i even said that we have a really very important day to observe and god forbid ladies and gentlemen over here people do not have this habit of visiting their doctors very regularly and it's until that time that something cannot be done of that very problem which they were facing or coming across and they had to rush to the hospital and it's an emergency and it's chaotic so today it's very important that we kind of talk about the do you want to say that you world say oral this. health yeah. day ladies and gentlemen which will be on sunday 20th of march but since we do not have a show on sunday we wanted to kind of give it to you attention that to on friday so ladies and gentlemen the theme this year around is be, be proud, proud of, of your, your smile, smile. And when we talk about smile, ladies and gentlemen, that's the most beautiful curve on any human <laughs> body. And we really need to kind of look after it because God forbid, if my smile is not okay, I think I will be a little shy to be on television. <laughs> What about you, Mahin? Yeah, you're, you're uh, saying the right things. You know, we don't care about uh, teeth and it is as important as our skin and yeah. hair. And it is so important for us to take and care. And the amount of time I'm using my teeth, munching something, eating something, I think I've overused them as well. But it's equally very important that we kind of look after our oral health, ladies and gentlemen. Because unfortunately, there are a few people who might not even know how to brush and I was one of them till the time I started to do this show and then these amazing doctors came on to the show and showed us how we really need to do it. So how to look after your oral health is something which we will be talking about and in between how research is very important for medical students is something we will be talking about. So we are very lucky that we've actually been joined by somebody who happens to be an MBBS, MPhil and PhD. She happens to be Professor Dr. Asma Irfan. Hello ma'am. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Wa alaikum assalam. Kaisi hai ma'am? I'm okay. Thank you very much for joining us alongside uh, Dr. Asma Irfan, ladies and gentlemen. We're very lucky that we've been joined by the principal dental college, High Tech IMS, and he is Professor Dr. Irfan Shah. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Sangeet khairam barabar. Assalamu alaikum, and thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Wonderful to have you. And the next guest that we have is Associate Professor, High Tech Dental College, Texla, and her name is Dr. Shahreen Zahid. Welcome to this program, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining us. Too young to be an associate professor. It looks wonderful how youngsters are doing such an amazing job. And then we have a third year BDS student, High Tech Dental College, and her name is Aima Kashif. Welcome to World This Morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for joining us. Wonderful to have you. I'm going to get started with the conversations with Dr. Irfan Shah. Obviously, first of all, I want you to raise the awareness and importance about World Oral Health Day as well and how SMILE is the best uh, curve on our human body. Let's talk about that and then we'll come down to the associate professor and how we really need to kind of do our research. Please go on. So uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, and I wish I could greet this word in as many languages as you did in the morning. <laughs> so uh, 20th of March is actually celebrated as World Oral Health Day around the world. True. 
and our colleges and our institutions, including High Tech Dental College, is in the forefront of creating awareness. So we have uh, uh, done a number of activities, and in fact, we have celebrated an entire month of uh, oral health awareness creation, and we have run free dental treatment camps at our institutions, our wow. hospitals, in which we have treated about 10,000 patients free of cost. And, and when we talk about such treatments, sir, what kind of treatments were there to, to be offered to people for free? So, like you mentioned, uh, the awareness regarding oral health, dental health, mouth health is yeah. lacking in our societies. Yeah. Uh, many patients present with uh, late stage dental cavities, gingival or gum diseases, bleeding gums. So, these are the things that are common in our societies. And we were offering free dental treatment for all these uh, diseases and disorders. Wow. So, so why are dental procedures so expensive? I mean, not just in Pakistan, all over the world. Well, uh, the, uh, mouth, the misconception is there that dentistry is expensive. We have institutions where comparatively cheaper treatment options are available. Uh, we are using mm -hmm. some of the best materials available in the world because most of those materials are imported, expensive, the dental equipment is expensive, and because it takes a lot of time for the uh, doctor to spend on the patient. So if a medical doctor spends, let's say, five or 10 minutes on a patient, we spend an hour or something like that to treat mm. those dental diseases. So it's time, mm. resources, equipment, and material. Everything is expensive. That's why dental treatment ultimately and becomes thank expensive. Thank you very much for saying that, sir, as well, because it was really very important that we share it with people as well. And ladies and gentlemen, what I have witnessed is that it totally depends on which clinic you're going to. You know, so they're <laughs> very modern clinics. You know, they will have some amazing lamps, expensive lamps outside their clinic, a wonderful receptionist. And then all of a sudden that, you know, that chair you lie down on, you know, it's, it's just very expensive. So, you know, you already know that you're going to pay a lot of money. But imagine that there are hospitals, as Dr. Saab has mentioned himself as well, you know, talking about high-tech IMS as well, talking about IMDC where there are free camps as well. And you can go and you, you can just get your teeth fixed for less than 400 rupees. So it's totally about who you choose to go to. And I think everybody needs, everybody has the right to go to whoever he wants to or she wants to go to. But very quickly, I'm going to come down to uh, Professor Dr. Asma over here as well. Now, uh, I think I have mentioned it before as well, and I believe in it that research is very important. Every single day, we have to go through some vigorous research to be over here in front of our audiences as well. Yeah. Ma'am, what I would want to kind of ask you is that without any research facility, how do you think that students will be able to do their research work? We have those classrooms. We have everything we need to kind of do whatever we want to do. But yeah. we do not have research facilities within universities. How do we come up with that, first of all? Yes, this is the main uh, problem with our students and our um, uh, economic conditions of the country. Uh, previously, HEC used to provide us with funds and financial as, uh, assistance. assistance as well. And I'm also, uh, I got in 2009 when I was doing my PhD, HEC also gave me funds and there were a lot of medical PhDs at that time. True. But you will see that in these days, there is a lack of funding and the PhDs, they are not available to teach other students. True. And uh, um, this teaching process is in a, a lagging condition. And which is why, you know, I certainly wanted to ask you on a very lighter note. So if you've <laughs> had done all MBBS already and you were a doctor, why did you do another PhD? <laughs> I mean, t what, do people actually call you Dr. Dr. Asma now or is it just no, the doctor? No, if you see in the world, basically all the clinical side, they have to do PhD. All right. And PhD and research, it is part of the curriculum. I think research is a part of PhD anyways. No, this is part of curriculum. Okay. So in our society, in our conditions, most of the people, they think that research is not so good and it is a very boring subject. All right. But this is the basis of medicine. And you see, this is basically research is creation of new knowledge. True. Mm -hmm. And someone has beautifully said that research is to see what others see. And it is to think what no one has ever thought. Wow. Like so, finding solutions yes. and, and saving patients' life or maybe working for your society. Yes, in Quran, Allah Pak says that uh, uh, when you save life of a human, it is as if you have saved entire humanity. Humanity. entire humanity. Exactly, right. wonderful. So we are dealing with a human life. So research is the basis of and um, all the medical fields, and it is of high value. And I truly society. stand by it as well. And I have always been an advocate of research, ladies and gentlemen. It's really very important. But Dr. Saab wanted to add something. Yeah, I totally agree with ma'am that research is an expensive commodity, but 
advanced level research is yes, expensive, but basic level of research is actually not that expensive and we at medical and dental colleges are now promoting research extremely well. So many of our students are actually indulging in research projects uh, at their own level. Exactly, that's wonderful. So I wanted to move on to the associate professor, a very young associate professor over here in the studios with us. My question with, for you is, now while you were studying and now when you're teaching, how many times have you come across that, okay, that what you learned after some research, it has now changed and that you have to kind of teach them something which is newer to you and to your um, other staff members as well? Basically, um, I would base my dentistry and the whole journey of reaching to this point of more than 14 years of experience. I would mm -hmm. say that throughout these years, I have linked myself to research and whatever I am to wor today is because of research. Right. Whenever we have to treat a patient, there, there are situations where haf we have to look at the journals and where we have to check you know, which treatment is best for this particular case. Um, as the treatment modalities are changing every day, True. you know, it's um, the technology is improving, materials are improving, uh, even the techniques are coming. Every day you'll find a better technique. For example, in, uh, when you're uh, treating um, or uh, doing surgeries, yeah. uh, you go for uh, open heart surgery, right? Yep. But now we have pinhole surgeries as well. Exactly, so we have keyhole surgeries. Exactly, yes. same is the case with dentistry. Everything is evolving. Earlier, we used to think that, you know, dentistry is painful and people still think that. I think it's... I think that is why fear is related to, you know, visit, visiting a dentist always. Exactly. There's a certain kind of fear. No, we're not going and there's a delay. Are you scared though no. of going to a dentist? <laughs> no, I am not. I just had, I had a checkup. Exactly. Yes. But so we are now creating awareness that dentistry is no more painful. Please yeah. do visit us and you will have pleasant experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Only so if you have a problem, just don't start visiting anyways. You know, you have no problem, but doctors are going to Since you all are don't doctors, do I needed to ask something. How important are clinical trials in like helping the research documents that you have presented? And if there's a case, um, uh, are there people who are willing to volunteer for such cl clinical trials? Yes, people. You are asking her, I, I'm ask, asking Anybody all of answer. you. Yeah. Uh, people are always uh, very willing to participate. The reason is they need treatment. So there are many diseases in Pakistan which are prevalent and they need to be researched. Uh, if you see diabetes, hypertension, anemia, and uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency. I have worked on vitamin D deficiency and there is a very interesting thing which I would like to tell you yes, that our patients, we have done clinical trial and we found that vitamin D deficient patients, they had a genetic defect. There was a gene mutation in the CYP24A1 and due to this genetic defect, these patients are prone to have heart diseases. Wow. So by checking these genetic defects, we can detect those patients and we can prevent the prevalence of heart diseases in Pakistan. And, and you really need to stay over here because I have another question with that. But I want to, really want to move on to Ms. Saima as well because she happens to be a third year student. First of all, why did you pick up on dentistry and why did you bring all of the, your toys to our uh, show? <laughs> why did you do that? towards science uh, but a few years back I underwent serious dental procedures okay. which gave me the answer that I needed to choose dentistry so it made me realize that I want to be that person for my patient what my dentist is for me wow. Oh, wow. yeah and then uh, I found high tech my college and then ever since that then I've been following my dream and I've been following my aim and how's it going so far is it going great uh, yeah it's amazing especially this year I've been uh, practicing on patients I've been uh, my teachers have been helping me yeah. uh, supervising me so it's are you been pursuing research uh, not right now. Uh, Obviously, there's yeah, a lot of yeah. burden because anyways, they said you know, that, that it's a part of curriculum. So I thought I no, might it, it is a part of curriculum, but they first of all really need to be doctors first, and yeah. then kind of yeah. do their research. But yes, please. For that, I would like to add one thing that you know, um, she is in third year right now. She has got the tools with her to do the research. True. Yeah. In first year and second year, and up till third year, we uh, give the tools through the curriculum. Yeah. Uh, to teach them how to do research. All right. And once that they're capable of it, then they start the research. All right, so now what we're going to do is, I want to do it the very fun way as well, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, a lot of people, majority of the people do not know, uh, God forbid, if their oral hygiene is on point or not. So we have, you know, as Aima has brought in a lot of toys, uh, because she's becoming a doctor and an aspiring dentist as well. So we want her to kind of tell the rest of the world 
how do we really need to brush our teeth you know explain why did you bring all of these you know yeah, let's so, let's start get started with that yeah so the basic mistake that the general public makes is the way that they brush their teeth can you pick it up and then show us how we really need to do it okay. yeah it's all right so what the general public usually does is they go for the basic horizontal scrub which okay. is basically this i think we all practice this yeah, yeah. habit jaldi, bas <laughs> yeah. 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 and in this we forget to brush the other aspects of our teeth and we also uh, cause a lot of damage to our gums okay so that is something you're not supposed to do and and what do we okay uh, you know i think that's a question for either your associate professor or doctor what do we do with receding gums it just happens so it's one thing that advancing age has some natural anatomical or normal uh, receding of gum, recession of gums but the <laughs> other thing is that if you if you use faulty brushing techniques just like Ima was mentioning so traumatic brushing is one component okay. and lack of oral hygiene and keeping your teeth not clean is another factor that exaggerates the recession with the passage of time all right so again and again i would be emphasizing creating awareness is the key so there's yeah. another question and that's that what we're doing but can we get just yeah yeah, that? yeah please yeah, yeah. Please. so the correct way for you to brush your teeth is to basically keep your toothbrush at a 45 can, can you just pick it up so that the camera can see it clearly and our people can so see it so basically you're supposed to keep your toothbrush at a 45 degree angle just like this yeah. i hope everyone and just go down uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed ride to ride a motorbike <laughs> <laughs> kind of like this. because you're supposed to engage your gums as well not mm. just your teeth so you're supposed to provide vibratory motions like this and then a sweeping action like this All right. so what this does is it basically removes the food or whatever you had from your gums and from in between your teeth All so right. you do, do this and then you swipe it off like so that. is it manual brushes the old school manual brushes or the new electronic brushes what you is better you can use any brush you want manual brushes i think this is the most accessible brush so you can use this but then again if you can buy an electronic brush you can go for why it not yeah well. but you can do this with a manual brush as well so you do this and then you swipe it off and then you have to make sure that your other aspects of the teeth are also being cleaned like behind the back aspect of your tooth the chewing aspect of your tooth so basically cover all of them and Wonderful. then the most important thing that i think people forget is brushing your tongue as well yeah, yeah. there is a lot of bacteria that accumulates yeah. on your tongue so you need to make sure that you uh, brush your tongue like this and for a lot of people who bad mouth about other people please make sure that you brush your tongue very regularly <laughs> all right because you certainly do not need to do that as well but since sir we are very on short on time as well what is your vision of spreading awareness to our audiences uh, we go we're going out in 46 different countries as of now so please go ahead whatever you want to say yeah it is through public and and public campaigns that we can create awareness uh, at our institutions we have as i mentioned uh, celebrated an entire month yep. we have created awareness through public print and electronic media we have visited schools and we have talked to 2000 students in our vicinity how to take good care of their uh, mouth and teeth how to take good care of their faces what are the preventive measures for preventing caries and what are the preventive measures for oral cancer which is a serious disease True. about which uh, awareness is really really lacking exactly. so we are we are implying every possible way to reach to the public both through print and electronic media and dr sharin said from you how for how long can we use our toothbrush uh, that's an important question uh, the time duration uh, could be 2 months okay. but uh you know you have to look at the bristles if they are going in different directions yeah. uh, or probably staying back in your mouth you will exactly. need to go through your breath and i would like to add one more thing that we're missing here which is flossing uh, you asked about gums uh, you know gum recession is taking place because you know the bacteria and plaque accumulates between the teeth and the gum and okay. the best way to clean it is through flossing wow. people floss later at the age but you know earlier um like it, it's it's so earlier the better don't you think it is better to give training to like young mothers so that they can you know teach their children i mean even with the, babies right? yeah you know because yeah, babies they babies and young mothers maybe what we for that what we do is uh, we go to schools and create this awareness and we teach the students as well over there how to do it and the teachers so that it can be emphasized again and again at the school level oh that's that. wonderful so towards the end professor dr asma you know we know this because of the fact that you know there were people who were researching continuously and making sure that they're going to bring about a positive impact on the lives of people and give them a beautiful smile and that's what everybody wants even though we do have veneers but yes we'll talk about that some other day but how do you think that every individual within their own capacity can learn which is not written in the book and still needs to be identified by someone who actually has that mindset uh, okay 
development of research culture is important for every institute true and what i would like to tell you that islamabad medical and dental college yeah. college it has very high or high tech yes yes it has very good team of researchers true and this college is superior to many other institutes in islamabad because of development of research culture all right many of my so it's students, just the culture or the facility yes facilities okay. as well because it's highly developed and i think that government should uh, provide us with more funds and more uh, technical labs okay for improving the research i think that's wonderful ma'am thank you very much everybody thank you very thank much you dr irfan shah saab thank you very much professor dr ms asma as well thank you very much associate professor thank you very much aspiring student and inshallah you will turn out to be a wonderful doctor inshallah. the way you have exhibited i think you're already doing wonderful job as well you know people no do take a lot of pressure off medical uh, studies as well ladies and gentlemen you know this is the future of pakistan we want to educate each and every individual we want to share knowledge we want to share the research which we do with our artists in 46 different countries as well and now it's your responsibility to take this word forward mahin you want to say something yes i want to say the same we we shared a lot of important information and uh, we hope that you actually implement that information in your lives exactly and we are observing your mr shakur today as well so please make sure to remember us all in your prayers make sure that you have a heart full of gratitude make sure that, that you keep on continuously thanking allah almighty for all is bestowed upon you uh, for all the blessings you have in your life as well till the next time look after yourself since it's juma please make sure that you remember me mahin our entire team in your prayers as well look after yourselves 1 2 3 good, good morning. morning thank you thank you thank, thank you, you sir